discussing today's top stories with Vanessa Feltz and Tom Swarbrick. First, following his decision to travel to the Ukrainian border to report on the plight of the refugees fleeing their war-torn country, Rob Rinder is joining us live from Poland. Morning, Rob. Morning, Rob. Um, thank you for, for joining us now. What was your reason for going out there? Morning, everybody. You know, um, the reason I needed and, and wanted to come firstly was to, to report on this refugee situation. And uh, uh, there is a personal complexion, you know, sewn into the threads of the tapestry of my story it is my grandfather's story, who was a Holocaust survivor who came sadly too late. His family were killed after the war. But as a person who's proudly Jewish, you know, I remember the stories of the kinder transport, the very few that were lucky enough to get out on trains, uh, the very lucky few, the too few, who arrived and were gifted sanctuary in the UK. And of course, the story of my other grandparents who left the bombed out London Blitz on trains again to reach the sanctuary and the gift and the hospitality of the countryside working class communities who were prepared to look after them. And as I'm standing here at this train station, that was eight decades ago. It's difficult to believe that it is 2022. The other day, as we were standing here, as the trains come in, it is women and children. You'll be aware, of course, that the men in the Ukraine uh, must stay and fight, and they proudly do so. The women who arrive with their babies in arms want to go back to the Ukraine to be with their brothers, to be with their husbands, and in many cases to be alongside and to be re reunited with their sons. But as they arrive on their trains, they arrive cheek to, dra cheek to jowl, packed on wagons in a scene that is reminiscent of the stories that are in our history books, of the documentaries that I've made of the footage of the Second World War. We have no muscle memory really to describe how it feels or what it looks like, but I can tell you standing here that it feels like a distant past, not like a modern Europe. You say, Rob, this is what happens when we forget history. Yeah. You know, it's Winston Churchill's quote that um, those who forget the past are doomed to uh, repeat it. Now, whatever the politics are that led to this situation, uh, or whatever your point of view, what we also have to remember is a society is valued on how it treats the least amongst itself. Uh, and in the past, we took too few. Uh, we weren't ready. We weren't necessarily prepared to answer the call for help. But that's not the situation now. There is so much good news, so much light uh, in the darkness um, of all of this, not least the over 50,000 people who have signed up and have prepared to gift a room in their homes. And I have to say, Philip, you know, the vast majority of those people are working class communities who have been the most challenged. Um, and on top of that, I was at the border uh, uh, yesterday and I saw ambulance men uh, and I saw police officers from the UK and ex-military men from the UK, all of them on unpaid leave, hanging, handing out sweets, giving people food, um, arriving. But as I say, um, the value of our nation, our greatness, is assessed by how we treat the weakest and answering the call of refugees. And we want to do that. The problem at the moment... Uh, and I emphasise this, is really cutting the government red tape to make sure that Ukrainians who want to temporarily receive that help are able to. And it's pretty difficult to get that help, I'm afraid. Um, Rob, um, for the refugees to reach the UK, the office is about two hours away from where you are. So how are people expected to make that journey to actually come here? Right, that's precisely uh, the problem. So as they arrive at the train station, there's a reception centre. It's got the Ukraine flag on it. And you go in and it's bustling with people doing good, many of them British charity workers. And there are desks with national flags. And we counted a number of them. We saw French flags and German flags and even a, a couple of Japanese people who had flown here in order to help. There is no British flag there. So you've got to get on a bus to the, the town where we're staying. That's probably an hour and a half away or get to the British Embassy in Krakow. You've got to fill in a 50-page form. You've got to have access to uh, the internet. The reality is um, there is no greater or better example of who refugees are, what they are. Uh, these are mothers and children, often with one bag, often with the clothes on their back. You know, how are they supposed to do that? The answer is, I couldn't. I was here with my interpreter. 
she speaks Polish, I speak enough Russian to try and navigate uh, this process, and it's far too difficult. We don't have to talk the British government down. What we have to say is there needs to be more help on the ground. You can hear the bustling of the train station here, and I'll tell you, all that's required is more help. Uh, it's not going to cost much in plane flights. Even there are various planes who are prepared to take refugees for free to the British families, who I must repeat, tens of thousands of them are already offering their homes. The difficulty is they can't do the paperwork, they can't fill in the forms. Rob, and is, that is... seems to me to be... You say you don't want to talk the sorry, government... Sorry, I'm interrupting you, forgive me. No, 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 not at all. I, I, I interrupted you, but... Uh, but the... I'm sorry, Phil, I couldn't hear that. Don't worry. Um, you say you didn't want to talk the government down. We've heard yesterday, we've watched the ministers who've said, you know, you can go online, you can select the family that you want to, to bring over. Um, you have this, this particular area, which there are so many people have said, right, I want to help, I want to help. Um, relatively easy... I suppose, from our side of things, um, yet you have right. people over there who actually have family here, who could get here because they've right. got family. We were discussing this this morning. You know, you've got the, the, the basic things of having a phone signal, having I enough credit on your card, being able to access online. Anyone who's ever been in a crowded place and tried to text someone, everyone else is texting at the same time. Yeah. Trying to get online and do that sort of thing. Having just had the most horrific experience that a human can have, maybe saving your family, yeah. losing every single thing that you've got in the house, maybe even your passport. How the hell can you do it? Um, well, you've just said it um, better than I can, Phil. That's exactly right. And, you know, um, I don't want to say it's a matter of national shame and, and embarrassment, but, you know, it is. Um, and it's eminently soluble. You know, the scheme that's announced um, has all of the right virtues. The British people are absolutely great, but they've made a promise to the Ukrainian people. And what are we saying about who we are if we're not able to deliver on this promise? And it's not a problematic issue to resolve. It's not beyond the bounds of our great government. <laughs> I, I, I call them that, our great British government, to solve this problem. It's an administrative issue. If they could get the people on the ground, at the reception areas, at the train stations, to help with the paperwork, to say, to hell with that, we don't need you to fill in these forms. Bearing in mind, I know people are worried about checks and who's in their homes. Let me repeat, these are chiefly women and children and men over 60. Um, I'm going to put it in this way, Phil. You've described it perfectly. It ain't that difficult to solve. Um, let me just finally, uh, Rob, because um, I know you have got stuff, very important stuff you need to be doing. Um, um, Oksana, uh, be one of the things that one of the reasons you went over there yeah. was to try and help them. I think o o Oksana's uh, grandmother is 95, I think. So, um, yeah. uh, ha how have you met up with them yet? Do you know what you can do for them? Yeah, you know, um, thanks for mentioning them. It's been such a gift to um, be able to give something back to Oksana, you know, as perhaps as silly as it all is against this background. You know, there was such joy in Strictly, and she was a teacher, and I loved every bit of it. And then I, of course, had discovered that her uh, family, her grandparents, were trying to flee Ukraine. It took them a week. They were avoiding shelling and so on and so forth. They managed to cross the border a couple of days ago. But, you know, and this is really uh, a, a story that illustrates the situation people find themselves in. Um, the 95-year-old grandma doesn't have a wheelchair, so we have to source that. They don't have their medications. Hopefully, in fact, I'm pretty sure we're going to get hold of as much as we possibly can and finally go and reunite them with the stuff they need um, tomorrow morning. Thank you, Rob. Thank, Thank you, Thank you Rob. for joining us today. Thank you.